Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over a little bit about ecological research methods. So there are three key ecological research methods. The first is the most obvious and so direct observation like going somewhere and observing different organisms in their natural environments. And so these are often called surveys. And so long-term or short-term surveys can last decades, 10 to 15 years. They can last weeks. They can be over the course of a couple of days on and off. It just depends on how much time you have and what you're looking for and looking at. Now, sometimes a method that is used in direct um, kind of, uh, I almost said competition, that's not the right word, but is used in association with direct observation is called um, mark and recapture. And that is where you capture an organism and you tag it to either monitor their location or their number. And so, again, you can use, um, you know, kind of like a audio signal from like a, the, if you're listening to like the noises that certain organisms make, like if you're listening for a sound of a particular hawk or a particular eagle, um, you can listen to mating calls and stuff. All of that could be used as a way of identifying locations of where organisms are and whether certain organisms are in different locations. Um, you can obviously directly interact with them. Um, I mean, Jane Goodall is kind of like the master of um, directly observing chimpanzees. Uh, I don't know why. This is just like a GPS device on the back of a turtle. But um, again, how you want to do that is up to you. But one of the ones that we're going to be using is mark and recapture. So mark and recapture... Uh, like I said, is exactly what it sounds like, but here is kind of what that is based on. So there is a mark and recapture equation. So R is going to mean the number of marked recaptures. T is the total in the second sample. M is the number that you marked initially, and then N will be then your total population size. So let me tell you where this kind of starts. The first thing that you always do is you go and find some population of organisms that you want to count, and then you mark a certain number of them. So this is the, the kind of first part. So let's say that you want to look at mice, and what you're going to do is you're going to capture some mice in a field, and you're going to put a little band on their leg so that they can be... Um, captured later and you can tell, oh, I already captured this mouse before. So the first thing you do is you uh, mark a certain number of them. Uh, and then let's say that we have this imaginary scenario where we took 200 mice out of the forest. So 200 mice, we put a little leg band on them that's a different color so that we can tell like, okay, that was us. We're the ones who put this little band around them. And then you return them to the forest. So you do, you literally mark them and let them go. Now, let's say you come back a week later, let's say, so that you know it's enough time for them to mix around. And now you recapture 250 mice from the forest, and that 50 of them have the leg bands. So if you are total looking at 250 mice from the forest that you recaptured, that would be the total in the second sample. You took 250. Only 50 of them had the leg band though. So 50 would be the ones that you already had previously marked. So our M was 200, that's the number that we marked initially. 250 is the number of mice we took in our second sample though, so we took 250 of them. And then R would be 50, the number that had those little bands on them. So we can find N, and so what we do is we rearrange our equation, N equals M times T divided by R. So I would set that up, 200, times 250 divided by 50, that means we have approximately 1,000 mice in our population. So this is a great way of being able to count something that is um, going to be impossible to count like on its own. So like if you were to try to capture every single mouse, that would take you forever. So instead, it's easier sometimes to capture a certain population of them, just a small sample, and then to come back at a later time and see how many of them you recaptured after you marked them. And that's how you would find them. Now, there are a lot of assumptions, and I mean tons of assumptions, that we are kind of using when we do this method. And so as long as these are being um, followed, then um, we're pretty much okay. But you, this doesn't work for everything. I'll just say that. So the first is that there are no new organisms. So in other words, there weren't new mice um, that came into this population. Okay, You're not giving them so long that the mice had a bunch of babies, Okay, stuff like that. 
um, also, the organisms are as equally likely to be caught, meaning that you are not just focusing in one area of this field so that you're only getting a family of mice. Instead, you're going all over the place in this field um, so that you're able to, you know, kind of get a good distribution of mice from different, let's say, families. I'll just use that term. Um, next, that the animals don't lose their mark. You want to make sure that whatever you're putting on them is not going to um, constrict them in any way, not going to harm them in any way. You want to make sure that um, it's not possible for them to lose their mark. So you want to make sure that you don't like have, you know, you don't wait so long that they're able to chew the leg bands off. You don't want to wait so long that like, you know, um, it, they're able to lose their mark in any way. Uh, another one is that you have to wait for enough time to pass so that these organisms can distribute themselves randomly again. So you don't want to go back within an hour. You don't want to go back within probably even a day. Um, you want to make sure that you give enough time for these mice to go wherever they would want to go and to maybe settle in a different location so that now again, they are as equally likely to be caught as a mouse without a band. Um, and if those things happen, then you can use this method to kind of um, estimate the size of the population. Also, experimentation. Obviously, we can do experiments. So we can do lab experiments, which is you know what it sounds like, an experiment that you perform in a lab setting. In ecology, though, that's not as really common. Um, there are like pros and cons. The first pro, scientists have much more control in a lab experiment than they do out in the field. But the con is that it's a natural environment right outside. So it's much more complicated. There are many things that you can never recreate in a lab setting. So sometimes, you know, having a little terrarium with some stuff in it, um, you know, with like a snake, a lizard, a couple of, you know, crickets going around in there, some scorpions, who knows what you have inside of a terrarium, right? But um, that might not be the ideal way of collecting your data. You might need to go out in the field and collect it yourself. Now, obviously, we have field experiments. Those are like, again, surveys and stuff too. But field experiments are experiments that you perform in the actual environment. And so your results there are normally way more accurate, but it's a natural environment. So not only is it a pro, but it's also a con. Um, you can't control everything. There are so many factors that are out of your control. Um, your equipment could get destroyed. You could get, you know, um, there could be a horrible snowstorm and everything kind of gets, um, all of your data ends up um, getting either erased or destroyed. Um, you could have gigantic uh, natural phenomenon, like a, you know, a giant sandstorm kick up that, you know, makes it impossible for you to even collect your data that you wanted to collect. And then last but not least, we can model things. And so we're not talking about, you know, fashion and stuff, but what we are talking about are using math to describe nature based on actual numbers and actual data. So you can create virtual ecosystems, uh, you can create um, gigantic um, computer-based systems that can run simulations that let you know uh, if this trend continues, here's where this will go in the future. And so here's an example of sort of like um, uh, a hole in the ozone layer that had been modeled. And you can see that the different colors represent the different amounts of ozone. And so again, if you are looking at a model in a computer, you can very easily just say, hey, continue the simulation at this rate. And then if it continues, here's what it would look like in the future. And that's kind of it. So we just wanted to talk about those three things. If you have any questions, let me know.